It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's our go. Hey! It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a wonderful podcast for you today. As we're getting closer to Thanksgiving, we enlisted Lydia Bastianich, a great, great cook, chef, TV personality, all-round superstar. And we do a quick bite with Morgan James, our talented, talented uh, singer. She has a new album out. I love her so much. More about them in a minute. We'd like to thank the good people of Scribd for sponsoring the show today. With Scribd, you get instant access to millions of ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more. Automated suggestions and hand curated picks make choosing your next book easier than ever. And we've got a deal. Go to try.scribd.com slash papa for your 60 day free trial. That's try.scribd. That's try. S C R I B D dot com slash Papa to get 60 days of Scribd for free. It's a great resource to get you to all these amazing books, two of which I have written. Oh. Lydia Bastianich is an Emmy Award winning public television host, a best selling best selling cookbook author. I think she's done like 15 books. Uh, restaurateur, the owner of a flourishing food and entertainment business. She owns and runs Becco in New York, Italy, all the Italy places. That is her. That is Lydia. She's an amazing, amazing person. So we're going to get our big Italian on today for sure. This is a great, great resource for all things Italian cooking. She's an amazing, amazing character. She's so fun to talk to. It's literally like talking to someone from my family who they're, they're kind of like no nonsense, but then when you get into it, you crack them and they open up and they're really, uh, really fun. This is her new book. It's called A Pot, A Pan, and A Bowl. Simple Recipes for Perfect Meals. Lydia Bastianich, she really just curates this stuff and just makes it really simple. I mean, she is a great resource. If you've ever gone to Italy in New York City, there's, I think there's like five of them now actually, all around the country. I know there's one in Chicago. Uh, you just go to these places and you're like, all right, this is, uh, this is, it's almost like climbing inside a giant cookbook. She is just amazing. Skill at lasagna, no stuffed shells. She gives me some advice about Thanksgiving. She really is uh, amazing, and we're very lucky to have her on the podcast today. It's a, uh, it's a pretty good thing that we get are able to get, like, our great comedian friends and then get these food legends, and uh, Lydia is definitely one of them. You'll see this that conversation is uh, is far-ranging. We talk about family. We talk about cooking. She gives me some tips and some solves about some things that I've been uh, desperately trying to figure out about tomato sauce and serving pasta. A great conversation. And then when we come back, we're going to spend some time with Morgan James, who is one of my dear, dear friends and a great, great uh, musician and singer, and she has a new um, a new Christmas album out called Magnetic Christmas. But more on her after this. Let's start off with the great, the legendary Lydia Bastianich. I've been a uh, huge fan of yours as growing up Italian myself and being surrounded by grandparents and parents who taught me how to cook. Watching you is kind of like a parallel part of my life, and. Uh, and not to insult my family, but you uh, are even a better cook. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you can be. Every, every grandma is a good cook. It's true. <laughs> I love all the wisdom that you would pass down with those little videos with your mom. I, huh. uh, I always remember the, uh, the two fingers of wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Two fingers. <laughs> yeah, if only I could stop at two fingers, it would be great. Well, I, you know, I don't know how many times you can do the two fingers, but, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. And I can't believe what number cookbook is this? Is this 15, 16? 
Well, it's actually 12. There's some books, other books in between, like okay. a memoir, children's books and all that, but it's the 12 cookbook. Right. Lydia's A Pot, A Pan, and A Bowl. This seems yes. to be... This seems to be a a um, something I've been seeing in in the in the food world a little bit lately. The idea the New York Times does a lot of uh, pan cooking, like every in one single pan. Um, but yours is really takes it to another level because you're taking really dishes that usually are super complicated, like lasagna. Like if I'm going to make a lasagna, I know the kitchen is going to be a disaster for a good week and you actually get it down to one skillet. It's very impressive. One skillet, and did you notice? I mean, that was my first with pre-cooked pasta, you know? Right. I, 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 you know, I always make my pasta, fresh pasta, and that's the thing. But you know, things, the life is moving on, and especially with COVID and all that, people are, are cooking more, want to cook more. And uh, I, I said, let me do a little research here. Let me try, so I tested. Uh -huh. The pre-cooked pasta. Let me tell you, it's fantastic. You know, really? you have in one hour, you have a pasta. You got to try it. That's the pasta in the pan. You know, you come home. If you have some sauce from another date, day that you made or whatever, right. you have some cheese, some grated cheese, and you get yourself a skillet and you just layer it out just like it is out of the box. You put enough liquid and sauce and all of that. You put it in the oven. And to, uh, let's say, Half an hour, 40 minutes later, you got yourself a bubbly lasagna. Oh, my God. I mean, if you're saying that, it feels like I'm getting permission to do it because you have permission, Tom, <laughs> because there are some things you don't want to violate and you feel like you're cheating. But if you say it's OK, I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah, try it. Try it. Let me know then. Can I ask you a tomato question? Sure. OK, because I I'm always playing around with this and the difference, is there a distinct difference between the whole peeled tomatoes and the pureed tomatoes or the crushed tomatoes? Are, is, there, is there a difference? In, in general, to me, I think it is because if you have a whole tomato, mm -hmm. uh, then you see the tomato uh, and then you crush it and it's ripe and it's sweet and it's tender. But once it's crushed and milled, you don't know if it, there's some green in the tomatoes. You know, sometimes you get the tomatoes and there's some green, some things don't cook. Even mm -hmm. if you do it with fresh tomatoes, I'm sure that yeah. you get that left. So you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have that option. You want your nice whole tomatoes so you can see. And they contained the flavor. But even more than that, a specific, if you're making sauce, the plum tomatoes, the San Marzano tomatoes are the ones that you really should be looking hole in the can. Right. And that is, you know, the Samarzano, the plum tomato, that's that oblong tomato. And that tomato is good for sauces because it has a thin, thin skin. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of pulp, very few seeds. Seeds are tan and make the sauce bitter mm -hmm. and not too much juice, not too much acidity. So go all the way down the line, get yourself some whole Samarzano or plum tomato in its juice in the can and then you do the crushing all right good all right i like that because i i was i was just i'm suspecting that and i figured it must be but you know you see the, in the in the supermarket all of these cans of the other stuff and i'm like i don't know it's nice to just know for sure this is the way that it, that it goes yeah all right your intuition is right yeah did you ever meet marcella hazan i did i knew her you did. Uh, as a matter of fact, she's, I think they're redoing her book, The Essential of Italian Cuisine. Oh, really? And uh, they asked me to kind of uh, write the, the, the kind of the new forward for her. Oh. I did. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, some of the, um, I, until the very end, I went down to Florida and visited with her. Oh, wow. And she made lunch for us. And, you know, she had that famous spaghetti tomato sauce where she put the butter in. The That's butter and the she, onion. Yeah, that's what she did for me and was delicious. Yeah, uh, I did I did know her. She was a, a particular individual. Oh yeah? Uh -huh. What was was she can you describe her? I, I, well, I, she I, was she was, you know, she was very intelligent, wedded because she was a chemist by by studying profession. Uh, okay. And uh, so she was, you know, food and is chemistry. She wanted it to be just like that, you know formulas for her were very important. Right. So she was strict about the recipes 
following the recipes and conveying. And she was also very much uh, into conveying the traditional regional cuisine because, you know, here in America, we have the Italian American cuisine mm -hmm. and it's a delicious cuisine, but it's a different cuisine. It's not what the Italians eat in Italy. Right. And she insisted on, on making sure that her recipes were what they ate in Italy. Uh, so, you know, she didn't, I, I did two books on the Italian American cuisine because I felt the American Italian cuisine is a valiant cuisine, is a great, it's a good cuisine. People mm -hmm. still love it and eat it, yeah. but it's different. It's the story of the immigrants coming to America, right. not having the products they had in Italy and adopting their recipes to what they found. Yes, there's there's definitely it's it's almost like it's a, a culmination of all those immigrants that came from all different parts of Italy. And right. I, I talked to I grew up in New Jersey and there were people in Newark who from the old country they would have in the cellar. That was where they would keep everything like kind of refrigerated and they would have all the all the imported things hung up on the the, the meats and the cheeses. And and it was like in someone's home. But there was like this real rush to try and preserve it. But then it ultimately got mixed in with all these other um, Italians. And then we get New Jersey, New York. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, I think that the, the first big influx of Italian immigrants was at the age of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have 100 and plus year there of collection of cooking and uh, cooking what they found. Now, for example, uh, Tom, the Italian American cuisine has a lot of garlic. Mm -hmm. In Italy, we don't use a lot of garlic. We use garlic, moderate. We take it out of when we cook. We don't always, but here the Italian American cuisine has a lot of garlic. So, you know, when those immigrants came here, they didn't find the tomatoes, even though a tomato is a new world uh, uh, product. Right. Those ripe tomatoes that they had in Italy, the sun is different. They didn't have, they didn't have oregano. They didn't have basilico but they did find garlic and garlic reminded them of home and yeah. they kept on using that garlic and overusing it. <laughs> and hence the Italian American cuisine is really full of garlic. It has yeah. a lot of garlic. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I remember the, when I first was learning how to uh, make a sofrito and these different bases for sauces and there was no garlic in it. And I was like, that was so foreign to me because my whole family, <laughs> garlic was the main thing always. The base was garlic. Yeah, always, always garlic. <laughs> That's really so funny. So this, um, this uh, when you came over, you were, you were an early teen, right? I was 12 when I came 12, over, yes. Right, 12. And where, I'm sorry, where, where, where did you come from in Italy? So, so I was born in Istria. Istria is a little peninsula north of uh, uh, um, uh, Venice, that, in that area there, okay. it is now Croatia. Uh -huh. Because after World War II, Italy lost the war, and that part of Italy was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. So it was a whole period after World War II was tough, and we got caught, I was just born in that period, we got caught behind the Iron Curtain, being Italians, we couldn't speak Italian, all that. Ultimately, wow. my parents decided they wouldn't let us go back to Italy. We had to escape back to Italy. And in 1956, we escaped back to Italy. In mm -hmm. Italy, in Trieste, uh, we had some relatives, but we ended up in a refugee camp for two years and ultimately were brought by, uh, by the Catholic Relief Services, Catholic Charities and mm -hmm. Red Cross to America. Dwight Eisenhower was the president and he opened immigration for people fleeing communism. And we came, uh, I came as an immigrant at 12 years old in 1958. Wow, geez, what a story. That's, uh, that's yeah, that's, um, I, thought, I thought it was a struggle for my ancestors who came over just nicely on a boat and went, had a long <laughs> line at Ellis Island. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't easy either, but yeah, I was, uh, I was, it was a little, uh, <clears throat> a political dilemma and we had to be in the camp because we didn't have the papers and right. ultimately uh, it was difficult. But, you know, once we came here, uh, God bless America. There's no place like America. Yeah. Where did you, where was your first home in America? In New Jersey, mind you. North Burger, New Jersey. Oh yeah. North Burger. Yeah. They, 
Yeah, they found a little home for us. It was right on the cliffs. Now they have these new houses up there. Oh, but yeah. We were on the cliffs. And let me tell you, it was a beautiful little house. Uh, we shared it with a, a Canadian family. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we were right across the, uh, the Empire State Building. We saw all of Manhattan in front of us. What, a be what better view can you have? Oh, beautiful. That's so beautiful. I was a little further back. I was like Montvale. Park yeah. Ridge, like a little. You were you you were in the in the Lexus, uh, uh, luxurious yes. zones. <laughs> yes, it was very luxurious, exactly. And I could see from my desk through the trees. I could see the Empire State Building when I would do oh. my homework. I could see New York. I was like, one day I'm gonna get there. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. I, New Jersey is. I, I mean, there must have been. You must have felt pretty at home. Or your, or your parents at the time, because there was a lot of Italians at that time. Well, you know, uh, Tom, that's what happened. You know, uh, the Catholic uh, charities brought us, found us a home, but then they rallied the whole Italian American community. They all came. They, yeah. they brought chairs, they brought towels, they brought pots, pans. They filled our cupboards with foods. They really dressed up our home. They made wow. our home because, you know, we didn't have anybody, we didn't have anything. And it was the Italian immigrants and other, you know, I mean, there were other ethnicities and people that really cared right. uh, that I guess, you know, their ancestors were immigrants. And so they really, really uh, uh, came and sort of set us up. It felt so good. And we yeah. finally had a home. They found a job for my father. My father went to the, um, to the barber shop, the Italian barber shop, <laughs> met their people, and so found a, a better job and so on. Wow, you know, that's the, amazing. The community. And was the was what was food like during all of that time? Was your was your mom always always cooking? Was she? I mean, it's well, a, she was. It's a, it's such a it's such a um it's such a funny thing in a way because we think of food as this. I mean, it is very important and very cherished. But at that time, it was also just about feeding your family. It was survival. Survival, right, right. Yeah, 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 we're survival. And absolutely, you know, we had the kind of these, those basic, the, the same food also that we had in Eastley under communism, it was meager, meager of eating. So a lot of right. soups and a lot of beans, uh, potatoes and rice soup. She used mm -hmm. to buy chicken wings, chicken necks. We used to make soup. And, mm -hmm. and uh, our main course was kind of putting salt on the chicken necks and eating us till this day. I love chicken necks, yeah. you know. And so that kind of, um, you know, like one one kielbasa was, if you made a soup, was enough for the second course for the whole family, and so on. So so was that kind that kind of cooking yeah. that gave you substance, and you made a lot in one pot, not unlike this book that I just wrote. Yeah, you know, one pot, and uh, and uh, you had the first course and the second course all in one pot. <laughs> right. Yeah. It all comes from that. Was it when you were putting together this book, um, just remind the listeners again, it's Lydia's a pot, a pan and a bowl. And it's simple recipes for perfect meals. And when you were putting this together, was it, were, you, were there any of those dishes from your childhood that, that came back to oh, yeah. Your memory? Yeah. The soups, uh, the pasta dishes, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, I elaborated a little bit, but also a lot of that braising, you know, like where you braise, uh, uh, okay, so you got a little bit fancy where you some short ribs, but you know, yeah. we, we, would, we would braise kind of uh, even soup bones that had a little bit of meat braised and put some pot potatoes in there, some vegetables, and you had your meat, you had your vegetables, you had sauce to dress your pasta, so maybe a little pasta before, Right. And then you had your, 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 you know, you licked the bones and it was delicious. Yeah. Your mother must have been pretty proud of you when she, when you started to uh, become more well known and establish yourself in the, in the food world. She was very, she was very proud, you know, because uh, a lot of time uh, initially, I remember hearing my mom and my dad sometimes whisper, did we do the right thing? Should we have stayed home? Where, you know, where did we end up? We don't have any family here. Mm -hmm. So when it all sort of really worked out, and I think, you know, this is an opportunity. You can't waste it. You gotta make the best of it. You gotta show mom that all the, the efforts, uh, the, the difficulties that she had and decisions she had to make were yeah. worth it. 
Right. And so, right. yes, at the end, she she lived, she kind of reaped all of this uh, and enjoyed it. She oh, loved so it. Great. It's so great that she got to to to, to see it, you know, yeah. that she actually be part could, of it. Yeah. Hey, man, I told her, I says, Ma, she says, look at what you accomplished. I says, it's not just me. It's yeah. because she helped me. She lived with me. She and my father lived with me. Uh, helped me raise my children, helped me raise my grandchildren. Right. And so I says, Ma, you helped it. You're part, we're all part of this. Yeah. It's not a solitary journey. Yeah, no, it's not. And it's nice that, you're, that your children got involved in the business as well. I know I, I'd seen, I think, an interview with you and you said that you wanted them to go out and, and take advantage of the opportunities, but then they kind of naturally came back. Yeah. And, and it, it's such a nice story. They came back on their own, yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm very happy and proud. You know, now uh, they run the business, the restaurant business. Uh -huh. uh, especially after COVID, I kind of, you know, it's been 50 years. My first restaurant was 1971, so Whoa. 50 years. Whoa. So I, 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 uh, I enjoyed the books, doing the television, yeah. and, uh, you know, helping them when they needed. A lot of people who were in the restaurant business for a long time, when COVID hit, they were like, all right, this is, a, this is my cue to retire. Like this is all my, the restaurant business is so hard and you do it for so long. It's like, I can't, this is too much. <laughs> this is, it is, it is. It's, it's a tough business. It's a rewarding business. You know, you're yeah. with people, you feed people and it's beautiful to feed, to see with people, but it, the hours are endless. The, yeah. you know, there's, there's no holidays. There's none of that stuff. You're just dedicated to this business. Right. And uh, and so, yeah, I think that a lot of people took the opportunity to say, OK, this is the message. I'm yeah. going to stop now. <laughs> yes. I'll listen to you, God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I um I really enjoy cooking and I love baking uh, bread. I bake a lot of bread. That's oh, do become, you? become a, a passion of mine. And any time I have a little inkling of opening a bakery or actually making bread for people, I don't think I have the energy, <laughs> the, the, the amount of work that it takes around the clock for these bakers. They work so hard. It's never ending. And then you have the whole business aspect of it. Right. Then you have the whole marketing aspect of it. Then you have to, you know, all yeah. the bills, the, the everything is going up. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah. Think, no. think about it twice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Exactly. I'll just keep doing it for myself and learning from you. And <laughs> all right. So here's some questions that I have for you, um, just based on my own cooking in my own life. And I'm, this is why I'm so excited to, to talk to you. Um, all right. So you're making a dish like a cacio pepe, right? And you're serving four or five people. Should you be just getting the quantities for, I always like abundance. I always like a lot. I never want people to be done and then looking around for more. Mm -hmm. But I also, how would you serve it to five people? Would you put it on a plate and give it to each individual? Would you put a big, a big plate of it out for everybody? Well, I would, I would do it on the, on the plate because it's a pasta that congeals. It sticks together quickly. So, right. so, you know, if you have, if you're pulling it out of a big plate, you give it more chance to cool off. So make a mount in a, in a warm plate and mm -hmm. give everybody their share, you know? Right. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, gauge it. Don't, should you have some extra? You know, it could be a little bit in the pot. Doesn't even pay to be, to put it in the, in a bowl or something. Right. But I think, you know, just give somebody, uh, everybody a nice portion and then follow with something else. Follow with, with a salad, with a piece of cheese or something, right. just in case, you know? Because right. you, you don't want to, you know, them to go back and forth the big pot two, three times. Everything is cold and sticky and it's no good. Right. Yeah. That is the problem. Putting out the, uh, I just re always remember like going to my grandmother's house and this big pot, this big bowl coming out, everybody going after it. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, but it was, it was different. Be, uh, most likely it had some sauce, red sauce. Right. Cacho pepe, pepe is kind of a, this tight sauce. And, <clears throat> and also, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, as a family, we didn't wait that long. You went in and you took what you liked and then that's it, you know, there was right. none, no, no sort of waiting online. Uh, right. So, whereas maybe today, if you have a dinner party or something, there might be some, some uh, res uh, resistance in 
and going in right away and the pasta might get cold. No, right. plate the pasta. Plate with the pasta. pepe especially. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, do you like uh, carbonara? I do like carbonara. It's simple. It's delicious. It's good. Should you only make it with guanciale? I mean, guanciale is the tradition and whatever. But you can make it with bacon. You 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 know. I mean, mm -hmm. I am one that uh, that sort of. I want to give liberties to people cooking. Not always do you have everything. Not always do you like everything. Not everybody likes in your family everything. So you should have the liberty. Actually, a little bit of creativity, mm -hmm. even changing my recipes. I'm okay with it. Right. Okay. All right. These are good to know. You're going to make me so confident after this interview. All right. Um, my other question. Um, oh, what was it? Uh, do you ever make ciambella? Ciambella, ciambella, I do. For Easter, we make the ciambella. Uh, the 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 uh, egg. well, there's different ciambellas. Eh? There there's are. there's the cookies ciambella. There is the uh, uh, um, the bread, the pugliese, the bread, the hard bread, the ciambella. Yeah, the mm -hmm. yeah. So there's different ciambellas. Uh, it's ciambella means. Uh, like a lifesaver. That's what it means. Uh, okay, that's what the word means. I got it. Yeah, because there's the light pound cakey one that's very a little more fluffy, and then there's the other one that comes out a little more dense. It's a little more. Of yeah, a, yeah. A there's heart. it's the shape. It's the round shape. Yeah. Okay. Here's something that you and and Marcella Hazan actually opened my eyes to. It was the, in your recipes. You you have you both have take very much a lot of care with the vegetables. There is, it's, it's a, um, you, vegetables were always an afterthought. It was always like, oh, and then just throw it in and do, but the peeling of the asparagus or the peeling of the stem, using the stems of the broccoli, it seems like, um, it seems like you celebrate vegetables and things from the garden. Absolutely. You know, ever since I can remember, certainly my grandmother, vegetables were the protagonist. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the proteins, <laughs> Uh, what you had, you know, right. and sometimes you didn't even have any meat or fish or whatever. An egg was the protein. Right. So, you know, a vegetable with a fried egg or a frittata, whatever. So vegetables, you know, and vegetables, because my grandmother had the garden, were hard. You had to go and work the garden, the earth, you had to plow it, you had to uh, sort of hose it, you had to, right. all of that. So, you know, took a lot of work so you waste we wasted nothing and that sort of remains with you and right. also i remember you know for us uh, the outside of the onions and all of that if it's not in the soup it went for the animals you know we had the pigs that ate it and whatever right. so everything was recycled right right okay so my one last question on the on the menu on the menu side of things when you make a a thanksgiving dinner for your family uh what is the italian flair that maybe I should add to my Thanksgiving. Okay. Thanksgiving, I love Thanksgiving because it is the one holiday that's American, that we really make it American right. in our house. Everything else turns somewhat Italian, you know, whether it's Easter, <laughs> Christmas yeah. or whatever. Right. So what I do, which you could do very easy, is you make a reduction of balsamic vinegar, not too thick, but make a reduction. Mm -hmm. And in the last 20 minutes of roasting the turkey, brush the turkey with this balsamic vinegar reduction. Ooh. It gives it a nice kind of mahogany finish, a nice color, a nice acidity, a nice sweetness. So oh, nice. that's, that's, ah. one. Oh, okay. that's perfect. That sounds beautiful. That is great. I'm going to do it. I'm going to absolutely do it. Uh, your book, is there anything, any highlight that you would want our listeners to, uh, to what, what is the thing that you want our listeners to take away from this book? I would like them to, to, to feel comfortable and, uh, you know, the combination of vegetables, legumes, root vegetables, and proteins all mm -hmm. in one pot. Right. And I think what, what, uh, what I think is a problem a lot of time is the cooking time. You know, if you put uh, sweet potatoes and the, be and the meat at the same time, the sweet potatoes are going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So understanding you know, I have steps at this, at that, and that. But in case they decide to do something of their own, even in the oven, know the timing of the product that you're adding and know when to add it. Just time it mm -hmm. so it doesn't overcook. For example, 
I have a recipe here in the oven. I used a lot the oven, a sheet pan and uh, some Brussels sprouts and some onions and salt, pepper, oil, and uh, uh, some, some potatoes. And I put that in the oven and roast, roast, roast. When it is about three quarters done, I make a little space and I have, uh, I, I add to it uh, uh, portions of, of salmon uh -huh. with a little bit of mustard. So now the, the salmon is gonna take 20 minutes, right. but you see, time it. Right, right, Do, right, you right. cannot put it all together. You wanna put it all in one pan. You don't need another pan for the salmon. Just move all the vegetables, put the salmon there, put it back in the oven <laughs> and you've got yourself, you know, you come out, everything is sizzling and done well. So this is, you know, something. And when you braise, when you braise, let's say short ribs, you know, brown those first, nice and brown. And right. then you begin the sauce, then put a little bit of, Put your onions, your 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 garlic. Then put your tomato paste. Then right. put your wine. Then deglaze all of these things. Then let it boil a little bit, and then begin with you know once that is going already for half an hour, forty minutes, <clears throat> because short ribs will take about an hour and a half to two, almost two hours to cook well. Right. So then you add you know potatoes take forty minutes. You add from the end the potatoes. Uh, uh, sweet potatoes are going to take 20, 25 minutes. Right. You add that after and so on down the line. The carrots you add almost with the meat, you can add that, that the carrots will survive. Right. So understanding, you know, that sequence is the success of one pot cooking. Got it. Got it. Very cool. So Lydia, 50 years ago, you start your first restaurant. How do you, what is it that that continues the passion for you? What is it that, can, that, that, that gets you excited every day about always talking about food, sharing food with people? It's, it's what I love to do. I think it's my creative medium. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a painter needs to have his paints, need to, to, his uh, oil paints or whatever. I right. need to have my product. I need to have a kind of a setting. What, the pot, the right pot, what am I gonna do? And then what's beautiful is that, you know, you nurture people, you give to people. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's you, you cook something, I cook something that people ingest, take into themselves. There's not many things that, you know, yeah. uh, you can do that with, you know. Right. You, you, you look at things, you see things, but to eat, to put things in your mouth, in your body, yeah. and uh, to be the, the creator of those those things and that give pleasure and nourishment to people it's a special place to be you yeah. know and uh, uh, food you know food is sort of everything around us we're so worried about the environment well food is a vital element to hold that we need to eat less meat so we have less cows so we less have less CO2, uh, uh, or methane gas, uh, mm -hmm. and all of that. So, you know, uh, food is at the basis of who we are and what we do. Right. Well, this was so wonderful. I was so nice to meet you. I, uh, you, you, it's sharing those, those, even just sharing your little knowledge, like I'm going to look at tomatoes now for the rest of my life in a certain way, just because of our conversation. <laughs> good, good, good. I wish you much success and um, hopefully we'll talk again. Thanks, Tom. All have right, a nice Lydia. Thanksgiving. All right, you too. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Do you ever have a hard time finding the right book, an audio book or podcast? Do you ever have like a, you're just like, all right, what else? What else am I going to tackle? Where am I going to do it? I need a resource. I need a friend who knows what I like and gives me instant access to millions of eBooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more. Well, you don't have a friend like that because that doesn't exist. What you do have is a great ally in Scribd. That's S-C-R-I-B-D, Scribd. You get thoughtfully curated editor's picks, smart recommendations on your podcast, what your next book is going to be, audiobooks, all choosing your next book, making choosing your next book much simpler. The same thing goes for books. Now, instead of standing in front of your bookshelf, waiting for a title to jump out to, going to the store, you can get instant access to all of this great content with your good friends at Scribd. My books are over there. Yeah, you're doing great and other reasons to stay alive and your dad stole my rake and other family dilemmas. And, I, and there might be another book headed their way. 
Yeah. Well, I love this resource because it's such a good thing, especially when I'm traveling and you're just like, I can't carry all of these books, but now the technology has given me the ability to have all of this stuff in one spot and just download to my devices. They're really a great company and we really love having them on board. With Scrib, the world's most fascinating library is at your fingertips, all for just $9.99 a month. Explore all your interests in any format, ebooks, audiobooks, magazines. You get access to Scrib's entire library for less than the cost of a single book. Put it that way. Less than the cost of a single book and you get access to millions and millions of titles, uh, all hand curated picks, choosing, making choosing your next book super easy. So right now, go to Scribd because Scribd is offering our listeners a free 60-day trial. Free. Go to try.scribd.com slash papa. That's try dot dot scribd s c r i b d dot com slash papa to get 60 days of scribd for free perfect timing this time of year you can get all your holiday stuff in you can see you can enjoy it and pass it on and give it to other people thank you scribd for sponsoring our program all right now it's time to grab a quick bite with our good friend morgan james morgan is an amazing amazing singer she is just she's one of the best in the world she i saw her first um at the hollywood bowl she was doing the final concert for a prairie home companion and she was one of the opening acts for that show that legendary night at the hollywood bowl i walk in and there's this beautiful gorgeous woman on stage and she is just pounding out song after song and you know in an opening of Hollywood Bowl uh, not an easy task a lot of times it's just while people are being sat the place was riveted everybody was just focusing on Morgan the sound that comes out of her is so amazing so fast forward we've become really good friends and she comes on and does my live come to Papa's at the Village Underground all the time She's so amazing, so talented, and has a new album out. She always wanted to make a Christmas album, and it's called Magnetic Christmas. It's available right now. And she's also on tour, and you can go to morganjamesonline.com. That's Morgan James, morganjamesonline.com. She truly has become one of my uh, close friends, and I just can't believe that I went from seeing this beautiful and incredibly talented person at the Hollywood Bowl and now she is a part of my life and we are going to get on the phone right now and grab a quick bite and see what she's up to for the holidays and talk about uh, all things Morgan so enjoy Morgan James Morgan hi Tom how's it going it's going all right how are you doing I'm doing all right nice to hear your voice I know likewise oh man oh man <laughs> I missed the last come to Papa. I was sad. I know. I was sad, too. You were stuck at the airport. We were stuck at the airport, yeah. It was a big storm. <laughs> oh, <it's> terrible. <laughs> Isn't it funny how, like, for so long, because you tour so much, and yes. you're always you're always on the go, and we've talked about this, and then when we were during the lockdown, it was like, oh, this is nice being home, but then you're like, all right, it's time to go. i got to get out there. And then you're well, stuck in an I airport know. in North Carolina, and you're like, Oh, right, this part. This part. Well, I mean, it's it, you miss the other one the minute the, that you're back. You know, you miss, you miss living at home, yeah. and then then you miss being on the road, and there's really no satisfying an artist. No, I mean, exactly. <laughs> so this is exciting, though. You've got your new Christmas album and touring at the same time. Yes, yeah. I, I love Christmas music. I'm one of those. I'm one of those. Me too. People. No, let, yeah. let me ask you this, because it's, it's pretty early. Not pretty early. It's actually Thanksgiving is next week. Yeah. Um, do you break out any hint of decorations or anything before Thanksgiving? Uh, this year I am. I'm actually trimming my Christmas tree tonight because I start my tour on Thanksgiving night, so I'm not going to be at home to enjoy any of my decorations all Christmas long, or, you know, all Christmas uh-huh. season. So I'm decorating right. tonight, and I'm putting on the records, and I've already got a lot of candles burning, and yeah, I'm totally there. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So what do you mean, Chris, a Thanksgiving night? Well, the tour bus, oh, my poor band. The We start <laughs> on the 26th, Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. We start our tour in Washington, D.C. 
Mm-hmm. But that means that we have to get there and we have to load up the tour bus at 10 p.m. on Thanksgiving night. Wow. Yeah. So wow. it's just a Thursday. Just a Thursday. Just we got to load the tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, though. I really do. And I, I remember I remember when, uh, before I was a comedian, watching Letterman, that they would do the Thanksgiving show. And it always seemed so cool to me to be, like, uh, in a business that was, like, still doing show-busy kind of stuff, like, on the holiday. But, like, I was at home with my family, you know, with my parents and whatever. And just yeah. watching that, it was like, oh, man, I want to live that life. I know. And, you know, things like New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, I can't remember the last time I didn't work on New Year's Eve, you know. And, yeah. you know, performers have to take advantage of, of the holidays and people's, you know, good nature and their willingness to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So how are you going to handle uh, eating Thanksgiving? Will you eat before, the day before? Will you do any well, kind of treat for yourself or you just go? Well, you know, Thanksgiving is usually an early meal and everyone's, you know, taking a nap underneath the table by <laughs> 3 p.m. So, yeah. Or maybe maybe that's just my family. Um, yeah. So I think we'll, we're vegan. So, I mean, thanks, all the Thanksgiving food is a little... Um, altered for my Thanksgiving, but we'll eat early right. in the day and then we're going to start having to pack up. I mean, we're packing up the entire, all the gear, all the merch, everything. Wow. That's so cool that it's all there yeah. on, the, you know, on a bus. That's going to be so great. It's so fun. I'm really yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah. We've talked about that, but about I, as a comedian, just like seeing a like a band and you have everything underneath the bus and you just go from place to place. It's like, I've always been envious of that. Yeah, I think it's it would be so lonely, you know, to be a comedian. And the one <laughs> hand, if you if you kill, you're like the king of the mountain. Um, but if you if you don't kill, you're kind of you go back to the hotel and you're like, wow, I really I did that, I ruined that. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, you know, if I have a great night, my ba- my band's there to celebrate, and if I if I have a crap night, you know, they're we're all yeah. together. You know, there's something really. It's nice to be travel with a little baby community. Yeah, it, I, I, you know, I actually felt it pretty acutely this weekend because I did a couple shows in Boston and Vermont and didn't use an opening act even. I just, so, oh. which was fun, like, just to do an hour and a half straight. Like, the, the performance of it was great. Like, I love that kind of evening with kind of performance. Um, but when it was over, the band, the the crew kind of took off and... I just like settled up after like selling books and stuff. I just kind of walked back to my dress and everyone was gone. Like not even the crew was around. So I was like, I was just walking by myself out to my car. I was like, this isn't the way it's supposed to go. I should have one person as backup. Right. Just one stalker waiting for you in the back. <laughs> right. um, yeah, exactly. No, it is it is lonely. You know, people do think it's glamorous to be on the road. And uh, I mean, honestly, the the reality is, is that I'm like schlepping boxes and, and settling yeah. up. And at the end of the night, like you are kind of alone, we, you know, and thankfully mm-hmm. I get to travel with my husband and my dog. So I get to take a little piece of home with me. But yeah, most yeah. most of the road is not glamorous at all. <laughs> no, I know it really is. But it is that is kind of what makes it great. Also, it's like you're kind yeah, of it is. doing all this stuff on the outside. So your album is called Mag- Magnetic Christmas. A very magnetic Christmas. A very magnetic and Christmas. A very magnetic Christmas. It's named after the studio Memphis Magnetic. Wow, very cool. What's the history behind that studio? Well, Memphis Magnetic is in Memphis, Tennessee, obviously, and it's filled with um, incredible vintage gear from Nashville and all over the place. Um, like wow. the board that I sang through, Patsy Klein sang through, and Whoa. really historic gear. And uh, the owner, Scott McEwen, said it's called Memphis Magnetic because he, the entire time he was in Nashville, he felt this pull to go back to Memphis and make soul music. And he oh. took all the gear. He actually opened up the studio in what was an old bank. And mm-hmm. uh, interestingly enough, it was the first bank to give African-Americans loans way back in the 50s. So it's got a rich history of this, the actual soil that the studio is built on. Oh, that's amazing. Was it it's really it cool. Feel, could you feel it when you were recording? Oh, yeah. It's like there's just something so unhurried about being in the South and making a record down there and leaving the busyness of New York. 
Yeah. It just, every aspect was, we just took our time and, and we, you know, recorded, we recorded this Christmas album live with a live studio audience and uh, oh, to amazing. tape, analog tape. So it's very old school. Oh, that's great. So you, yeah. did you, you picked up the reaction also on tape? Um, no, it, we were filming also for video, so it, we didn't have, like, uh, reactions because we were editing together a Christmas special. Right. Um, but, but to have them all there and watch the process um, was really cool, and we had the full band. Everybody, everything you hear and see is sung live. Oh, man, this is so great. I can't wait. Yeah. And, pe- and people can stream it right now, right? They can get it right now. What, what, you know, actually, I was thinking about that. Like, you have the album, and what? it comes out. Is I mean, the old days would be like, go buy this album. Now you can just stream well, the you album, can, right? You can stream it or download it wherever music is found. You can also mm-hmm. order CDs and vinyl, and I have a calendar this year. Um, you can order those on my website or other awesome. shows. And then you can, we have a Christmas special on Mandolin. So that's up. You can watch the whole concert, the whole making of the album up on Mandolin. Oh, that's the coolest. Yeah. Your, what's your personal What's your personal favorite Christmas song to sing? Oh gosh, there are so many. I mean, I mm-hmm. I love something really dramatic like "Do You Hear What I Hear." Mm-hmm. Um, I we wrote three new songs, Christmas songs for the album, so I'm excited to sing those. Oh nice! Um, Give me some titles. I, uh, one's called "Long As I Got You." Nice. One is called uh, "Why Am I Lonely Tonight?" You know, I love a big. Salad. Um, yeah, a big that's sad, great. A big sad ballad. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we wrote a song called I Want to Know, which is like a kind of a really um, raucous, like gospel blues. Oh, this is so great. Yeah. This is so perfect. I'm so, I, I personally am so excited because we're, we're starting to, to answer the same question I posed to you. We're starting to break it out a little before Thanksgiving. Like it's slowly. Oh, good. The things are slowly, mostly out of, mostly out of nervousness that I have this vague feeling like, I threw some stuff out last year <laughs> and can't remember what oh. it was. <laughs> you know what okay. I mean? So I'm like, I hope we have a tree. <laughs> do, you, do you decorate a lot? Like, do you go crazy at Christmas? Yeah, we go pretty crazy. We definitely get into it for sure. And my big thing is the uh, is the village and the train underneath the tree. Oh, I love that. That is so classic. It's so great. And literally tomorrow I have uh, I have it planned that I'm going to the train shop <laughs> because I have a, I have some items that I need to pick up and some more tracks and stuff. And there's nothing, there's nothing better than just as a grown man going into a train shop like in the middle of a work day when you know other people. Oh are my like, god, <laughs> I love it. That's so adorable. It's, a, I mean, it does. It like makes you feel like a kid again. It's so great. Yeah, it's great. Well, I can't wait to uh, to listen to the album and share it with everybody this year. It's going to be great. Well, thank you, thank you so much. I hope you love it. And just quick, rifle off a couple cities of uh, of, of uh, where you want people to show up. Oh, my gosh. We're going to 23 cities. So we're going to wow. D- D.C., Philly, Pauling, New York, Boston, Minneapolis, Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, Pittsburgh, yeah. uh, Nashville, Atlanta, we're, Annapolis. We're all over the place. Oh, it's so great. That's so great. I know you had, you had asked me if, uh, if we were going to cross paths in any of them. I was desperately like... Oh, maybe I, I'm going to be performing in one of those places. And we're, we're really not. But uh, I maybe I can get close. I would love to see it. Oh, it's going to be a fun tour. It's going to be, um, we got a couple amazing Juilliard, brilliant Juilliard kids joining the band, and they're going to be on the road with us. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. Well, you're the best, Morgan. I miss you. I miss you too, Tom. Thanks for chatting with me today. All right. I'll see you real soon. All right. And Merry Everybody. Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas. Yes. And what to one and all. <laughs> all right, okay, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody, that's the big show. Thank you to Lydia Bastianich. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with her. She is amazing. I think we're going to have spend more time with her in the future for sure. And Morgan James, right? What a treat. Morgan James, make sure you go see her. Her tour is taking her all over the place. It's a perfect holiday event for you to go and capture and get her new album, Magnetic Christmas, available right now. Thank you to our good friends at Scribd for sponsoring today's program. And thank all of you. Go out there and get your Thanksgiving plans all settled and go out there and do something great. All right, you guys are the best. We'll see you next time.